Harlem knows a song without a tune. The rhythm's there, but the melody's bare. Harlem knows a night without a moon. The stars are where? Langston Hughes was born to a family of abolitionists. The name James Mercer Langston Hughes was given to him after his grandfather. In 1947, he moved to Harlem, New York. He's quoted as saying, I'd rather live in a three-floor walk-up in Harlem than a mansion in Westchester. Langston lived in this house from 1947 to 1967. Langston's mother and Toy Harper were best of friends. So when Langston moved into New York City and then Harlem, he looked up the Harpers, and when they purchased this house, they purchased it together. Langston occupied the top floor for both his living quarters and his office and the Harpers lived on the, the rear floor of this parlor floor. The way I became curator of the Langston Hughes house is that I purchased the building with my uh, wife in 1985. I knew it was Langston Hughes' house and there was a lot of articles, furniture, photographs, books, baby grand piano. When I came into a place of great history like this, I didn't have to think about how important it was to work at preserving things. My late husband, George Houston Bass, uh, George was uh, uh, Langston Hughes' secretary from 1959 to 1964 and lived with Mr. Hughes in, um, on 127th Street. This was a pulsating, very dynamic household. Uh, George used to uh, tell a story about going uh, on one of Mr. Hughes' wonderful walks through Harlem. The walks were very much a part of his evening ritual. That was part of how he wound down the day. It was a joyous point of the day to get out into the community and go and say hello to Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, or go down the street and be quiet and not announce that he was coming so he could really just see Harlem. George said to Mr. Hughes, Mr. Hughes, did you see so-and-so and so-and-so and so? Mr. Hughes said, no, I didn't see that. Well, Mr. Hughes, certainly you saw so-and-so, so-and-so crossing the street. I didn't see that. Well, Mr. Hughes, what did you see? I saw everything you didn't see. <laughs> there is a comfort walking among your people. There are a thousand stories. There are so many uh, ways to relate to uh, people you love. And he loved black people. And I think Langston, with his travels, his adapting of Cuban works and translations, his vast experience in Russia and other places, uh, made him uh, a very unique Harlemite. Langston was the bubble in the belly of Harlem, the most enthusiastic, wide open, happy, humorous, grinning person you could ever meet. Well, I feel like he's my own grandfather smiling down at me. I think he's vital to Harlem and the arts abroad. I thought he was very handsome. He was outgoing and he was pleasant to be around. And he laughed a lot. He, he liked to laugh and he liked to make people laugh. He looks at life kind of with a wink in his eye. I didn't know him well enough to know exactly what kind of man he was, and yet I know him precisely what kind of man he was because his, his work showed it. I know that he was a caring man. I know that he was a, a politically astute. I know that he was socially aware. I know that he was a lover of people and places and sounds. He reminds me, I think of a big ear. <laughs> he went around the world, especially in Harlem, and he heard everything. I am a Negro, black as the night is black, black like the depths of my Africa. I've been a slave. Caesar told me to keep the 
his doorsteps clean. I brush the boots of Washington. I've been a worker. Under my hands, the pyramids arose. I made the mortar for the Woolworth building. I've been a singer. All the way from Africa to Georgia, I carried my sorrow songs. I made ragtime. I've been a victim. The Belgians cut off my hands in the Congo. They lynch me still in Mississippi. I am a Negro, black as the night is black, black like the depths of my Africa. Langston Hughes attended Columbia University for a year to study engineering. He left because he was bored and lonely in the white academic world. But his nightly visits down the hill made him fall in love with the excitement, rhythms, and syncopation of Harlem and his people. This royal typewriter was one of three typewriters that we found upstairs in the study. Just about positive that they were used by Langston Hughes. Langston typed with, with just his two index fingers. So you can imagine him sitting there just with his two fingers just wailing away at these typewriters. This was up on the top floor. We have uh, moved down to this floor so people could get a chance to see it when, they, when they're in the house. I think it would be kind of fun for a, a kid to come here, or an adult, and actually type a letter using uh, Langston's typewriter. The typewriter of a famous writer, I think, is, is very, is, you know, it's a great thing to have. If Mr. Hughes changed even a comma or a semicolon, it meant the secretary had to retype the entire poem from beginning to end so Mr. Hughes could get a clear vision of how does, the, how does that look now that I have changed it. These things are like little clues of things that happened in Langston's life. Harper's preserved it. Now, this is the deed for the, for the property. A lot of people aren't sure if Langston rented a room or if he lived here. It, it clearly shows that the building was, was purchased um, by Langston Hughes, Toy Harper, and Emerson Harper together. Mr. Hughes kept track of every little thing he wrote on. In his own lifetime, he realized he was a, he was a mythic man. So he saved grocery lists. And he saved any place he had jotted down some notes and any place there were reviews in newspapers and magazines. This one I particularly like because it's Langston had all these postcards that he, he would write when he was traveling and send them back to the Harpers, particularly Toy Harper. And this was when he was in Florida visiting um, Mary McLeod Bethune. He talks about also meeting up with Ralph Bunch. It's clearly told story where he got a ride from Florida to New York City with Mary McLeod Bethune. And during that ride, she talked to him about uh, going on a speaking tour of the South. There's a photograph of Langston Hughes standing surrounded by children. And the story is that the, the children were kind of pulling up plants that, that the Harpers and Langston were trying to get established in the front yard here. So Langston's strategy for, for dealing with the dealing with this uh, situation was to involve the children in planting the garden. I've heard this from neighborhood people. Each flower was given the name of the child that planted it. He personalized things and he connected people to it in a very special way. The really last significant thing that I found in this house, and this is after being here maybe 12 or 14 years, and going through a box of, of wood that I found in, that was in the basement. And it was very late at night, and I was down there by myself, and I'm picking wood out of a box and saying to myself, you know, you really have lost it. You, you're, you're crazy. You're sitting here. Why are you going through this old box of wood? And I then put my hand on a, a, the metal rod that was attached to the children's garden sign. I found the sign of the children's garden in that, the bottom of that box of wood down in the basement. What the photo doesn't show and the real thing does is that there's names on the front and names on the back of that sign. He was just there, he was just available, like air, like sunshine, like water, like spring, like happiness. 
you know, like all the things that make life worthwhile. Mr. Hughes was very keen on honoring people's birthdays. So at the beginning of the month, he would write out all his birthday cards for that month. And in the place where the stamp was to be, uh, you were told when to mail this particular card because it couldn't arrive too early and it couldn't arrive late. And so that was a way that Mr. Hughes maintained his bond with all the friends that and who were then, you know, his family. Although he often wrote while he was depressed and lonely, Langston loved to make people laugh. He was nicknamed the Poet Laureate of Harlem. Langston was a part of the scene. Langston was a part of what it was. I came to this community to get. So Langston met me at the border and gave me the essence out of which I built myself. I guess he was sort of like an ambassador, going from one end of the community to the other, making people welcome. He said, come on in, let's sit down, have a good time. Langston gave me my hip boots. <laughs> Tell me. Wear these, my son, because you're going to be walking through a whole lot of pool out there. So put your boots on. Be hipped. Be booted. He, he had an innate sense of something very special about the African-American person in this world. This was a new set of people. We need to be reminded of who we are. He heard another rhythm that hadn't been on Earth before, because there hadn't been this uprooted people from a continent like Africa, yanked out and put into a land, and then mixed again with the Irish and the French and the West Indians and the Jews and the Poles. We take this and make our palaces and our glory. He spelled us. And I very well picture Langston in a nightclub, listening to the music and hearing the words, because there is an Afro-American sensibility, and he put it down. I ran away from home, Little Rock, Arkansas, in 1934, just after finishing high school with a prize fight and I only knew 18 days and I came to New York. Harlem in the 30s and the 40s, it was a swinging place. We had the Cotton Club, which we couldn't go in as patrons, and we had Apollo, Small Paradise. From the classics to the blues to Pygmy Markham, Ethel Waters, Lena Horn. I mean, just rich with talent. Just so much was going on in Harlem. When we were youngsters, in this very, very house, Langston used to, on Sunday afternoons, after church and all, he would gather those who were taking acting lessons like we were over at the American Negro Theater, Ruby D and all of us. And and we would all gather here and meet and listen to friends of Langston's. And Langston himself was a very good reader. And he would throw pillows all around here on the floor. Robert Earl Jones, James Earl Jones's father, he would read I've Known Rivers. Those were the days that we, we learned to love the works of Langston Hughes. A lot of the people who sort of flocked into the household, they were coming with their eyes and they were coming with their mouths to speak, they thought, just to speak and get inspired by Langston Hughes. But Langston Hughes was also keen on what vision they were sharing with him. In 1926, Langston wrote his first book of poetry, The Weary Blues. Hughes said the jazz and blues expressed the wide range of black America's experience from grief and sadness to hope and determination. He strongly believed that music and poetry worked together. Jazz and blues were key elements of the Harlem Renaissance, a time when African Americans in an uptown section of New York City started a movement to celebrate their culture. 
Bring me all your dreams, you dreamers. Bring me all your heart melodies that I may wrap them in a blue cloud cloth away from the two rough fingers of the world. I knew what Langston meant, not only as a poet and as a voice on the street, but I knew also what the Harlem Renaissance was all about. I knew what our founding fathers, uh, Du Bois and L.A. and Leroy Locke, were trying to prove. They were trying to say to the world that how can we be second-class citizens or inferior people if we can create first-class art? We thought we had to prove a great deal to the world to show that we were indeed a people, that we were not animals, that we were not uh, inferior and our arts therefore had to represent our capacity to excel at all levels at all times. And Langston said yes, but it needn't be stiff, it needn't pretend to be white. I wish the rent was heaven sent. In order to be first class doesn't mean you have to leave out, you know, being black. It's such a bore being always poor. It can be just as happy, just as creative, just as much us as it can possibly be. Shake your brown feet, honey. Shake your brown feet, child. Shake your brown feet, honey. Shake them swift and wild. Get way back, honey. Do that rockin' step. Slide on over, darling. Now, come on with your left. Shake your brown feet, honey. Shake them, honey child. When we don't know how to express what's in our hearts or in our minds, we think about, we can think about something that Langston said about it, and we can either laugh <laughs> or maybe we cry too. The portrait Hughes crafted over the course of his lifetime is filled with the rhythm and beat. His stanzas weave wildly smooth tunes about life as a black American. This is sheet music. It shows the collaboration that took place between the Harpers and Langston Hughes. But this is, this is a song, it's called Grab It and Hold It. A novelty comedy song by Langston Hughes. When I was just a teeny winty baby, one month old, mama gave me a bottle too big to hold. And every time I went to take a little sip, that god darn nipple slipped from my lip. I had to grab it and hold it, grab it and hold it, Grab it and hold it. I had my teeth, my lips was thin, raring to get that nipple in. Grab it and hold it. Give it a fit. Grab it and hold it. Grab it and hold it. Make that nipple fit. Grab it and hold it. Grab it and hold it. Couldn't let it go, because I'm liable not to get no more. When we first decided that a part of our responsibility as artists was to go around to schools, you walk out to a, 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 a classroom of little children sitting there, and the, the, the teachers just warned them all, we're gonna have some poetry today, have some more. and the kids are sitting there, they're, they're frozen. So now, how are you gonna warm them up? How are you gonna open them up? How are you gonna let them know that this is gonna be fun? Well, Langston had a poem that said, my old mule got a grin on his face. Been a mule so long, he forgot about his race. Now, I'm like that old mule black and don't give a damn. You got to take me like I am. When the school children hear people saying, damn, what is, is poetry? Damn is a poem? Woo so they would, they would get interested. Langston could create contact for you with anybody, any time, any place, anywhere. Asi and I, you know, my husband, we were always uh, using his poetry and uh, ask, writing for permission, and he would give us permission, and sometimes he'd write us little notes, especially for Asi and Ruby, you know, who do so well by my poetry. He was once wrote us in green ink. Ruby and I, uh, in a sense, competed with Langston uh, over his works. We always thought that we could read Langston's poetry better than Langston could. And we wanted him to sort of step back and let us do it, you know. We never had an open comp competition, you know. 
but we'd watch how he did it, and he would watch how we, we did it. And uh, always it was something to hear. Well, son, I tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stare. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor bare. But all the time I has been a climbing on and, and turning corners and reaching landings and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on the steps because you find it kind of hard. Don't you fall now. For I still climbing, honey. I still going. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. That's one of my favorite poems. Forgive me for crying. You know, I could, no. I could just think about, you know, because he heard everything, you know. He heard everything. He heard that which was whispered, and he heard the rhythms, and he heard the people, and he heard the laughter, and he heard the cries, and he heard the history, and he heard the aspiration, and he heard the hurt, and he heard the joy. Langston's poetry has been translated into over 60 different languages. And I can see Langston now laughing in all of those different languages. I met Langston Hughes in 1962. Now, that meeting was typical of, of the way Langston Hughes was. I had received a John Hay Whitney Award for a Creative Writing Award. That was, that was a national award that used to be giving out to minorities at that time. And Langston came to Detroit and there was a party given for him. So he said, where's this young writer who received the Whitney, and why isn't he here? And Margaret Danner, who was a poet that Langston Hughes had also helped in her career, she called me, I called Woody King. He um, uh, said, look, I'm going over to see Langston. Would you like to go with me? And of course, yes. We became his guides through Detroit, and which, which was his way of saying, you have to keep young artists in, you know, involved. Langston Hughes was... I don't think I met anybody during that period who had not been helped by Langston. If they were writers and they had ever met him, he made it his business to help you and to guide you. He made everybody at ease. If you were some five-year-old kids to old people that he would meet on the street, custodians, he treated everybody well. He was the kind of person that if he met you once, and you would think that was it, you know, he would meet somebody on the street, but he would send them a card. He was encouraging and instructive. He taught you how to use your gift more than on paper. My first play, Who's Got His Own, which, which was done at the American Place Theater, the people were pretty intense. And I remember he was saying, uh, all of them had such wide nostrils. And what he meant by that is everybody was breathing so hard, so intense. So he would, then you would say, what do you mean, wide nostrils? And then he would explain, you know, you, you could, you, can you keep that kind of intensity up for two hours or three hours? And, you know, I hope this is your catharsis, you know, <laughs> that you go into something, another style, right? So he was, uh, he had an interesting way of teaching. Langston was always helping people. He helped me tremendously when I got here. I was in and out of his uh, house all the time. He would name places. Uh, for me to go to and have breakfast uh, because, uh, you know, downtown where I was living in the village, a cup of coffee was like, I think this is amazing, man. You know, we're talking about the mid-60s, right? A cup of coffee was a quarter. He said, oh, you can get a cup of coffee for a dime around the Alice's, around the Mary's, you know? <laughs> Better than downtown, kid. I had the pleasure of adapting and producing a compilation piece of Langston Hughes' work called The Weary Blues. And uh, one of the... Um, 
real joys of uh, my career in theater was having Langston uh, as a person I would go to two or three times a week and say, you like this? What do you think of this? And then he would mark it in bold green ink. Langston Hughes was the people's poet, writing about their struggles, pain, joy, and dreams from the Harlem Renaissance through the civil rights and black power movements of the 60s. I looked and I saw the man they called the lover. He was coming down the street at me. I had visions in my head of being laid out cold or dead or else murdered by the third degree. I said, oh Lord, if you can, protect me from that man. Do not let that man make pulp out of me. But the Lord, he was not quick. And the Lord raised his stick and beat the living hell out of me. Now, I do not understand why the Lord don't protect a man from police brutality. Hit me, kick me, make me say I did it. When you throw cold water on me, I'll sign the papers. Langston Hughes just being Langston Hughes is, is an influence to me. The fact that he was he was writing in a vibrant time and he was and he was what he was writing was relevant to that time. It was in the language and in the dialogue of the, what people were speaking. It's the foundation of, of what I do. What's up, y'all? How y'all feeling? How y'all feeling? What up? What up, man? What up? What up? What up? How y'all feeling today? All right. All right. We're gonna look at some historical landmarks and we're gonna explore Langston Hughes' legacy. My to introduction that? to Harlem yeah. culture was like Harlem Week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, being a teenager and coming up here to Grant's Tomb to look at girls. As far as Harlem's place in our history, Harlem has always sort of been like a benchmark for black people culturally, like what we can achieve when we're in our own community and how beautiful we are. Brothers and sisters uptown at the sugar shop doing the Lindy Hop to Bebop nonstop. But when they stopped, when they stopped, when they stopped and looked around, what they found wasn't a renaissance, but a new kind of circumstance. Starbucks buildings erected, Disney buildings erected, past presidents taking residence in places of blood and tears that the ancestors gave. Guess y'all forgot that Atlantic Ocean is their grave. Tidal waves give way to spirits and hurricanes and heartbeats turn into drum beats cause this dream ain't gon' ever die. Wanna know why? It just be simple. We ain't gon' forget. Cause alive is Langston Hughes and I too have known rivers. And weary am I, but I improvise on birds, blues, breaking all the rules. I refuse to be confined and defined cause I am a poet. The new American dream, sticks and stones ain't gonna break my mule bone. I'm fierce and fearless. So this is a letter to you, Langston, and all the other ones that have gone before. How dare we not be brilliant? The father of our movement, without question. He just represents our beginning and our foundation. He's a pioneer. With Langston, he's just, just a colorful, bold individual. His material connects you to, to the fact that, you know, the more things change, the, the more they stay the same. I know this kid from uptown who got town used to bling bling his way Here's down the block. He flipped key trees and exited his spot, smashed nights in his spare time. He had the block locked down. The other day he took nine to chief, went straight to the dealer, got the drop top lit. Had the top down, his beef came around, got popped. Now he's paying less from the next I day. hate guns that make hip hop far less fun. Ask Lil Rick and Shine about the time problem. 
Hip hop is poetry. Oh, we're we're all on the same legacy. This is the same legacy as Langston Hughes, as the Negro spirituals, as the Psalms and the Bible. It's all the same thing. It's just you know the the language and the times change. Langston Hughes was the first black poet to keep it real and keep it in the hood. He was the original master rapper. Langston Hughes, from what I know about him, he loved where he was from and he represented it the same way that hip hop artists represent where they where they from. We just gotta carry the torch. No, 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 like a thirty eight, a forty four, a Glock nine. Top to protect myself, I'm a cock mine. Yo, Guns. you can be whoever, a Black Panther, a lap dancer. Guns. When it comes to respect, folks coming with the gat answer. Guns. Shoot at your feet like Spider, make you a tap dancer. Guns. I'm my amuser to you, you better have that answer. Guns. Reading poetry through school first introduced me to Langston, and I really got familiar with his work when I was in fifth grade because our teacher told us just to do a project about any person and I decided to do a project on Langston Hughes. So through the research, I read many of his poems, I read his biography, and I just fell in love with him. The passion is being reignited with some of the younger poets. I feel it's a passion because there are really no institutions that teach the essence of where he was coming from. Marvin Gaye guns. asked the questions we ask today still. What's going guns. on in our nation? The way that we live. I hate guns. Guns, guns got kids killing I'm kids. Langston Hughes had a love for people in general, but overall respected and, and, and personified the love of black people because of our essence and our soul, our honor and our integrity, our way of life. You know, you can see it within his poetry. I think everywhere people should appreciate Langston's skill and his intelligence and the way he wrote his poetry. So not only black schools, it should be in white schools, it should be in urban schools, it should be in suburban schools, you know. And if there was a way that even incorporated it in within the hip hop, you know, giving props to an original poet, showing that to someone that loved Harlem and just loved his culture and his people so much. I have the privilege of being at the Schomburg Center. The original building, uh, which had been the original branch library building, 135th Street branch, had in fact been closed and was just being used for storage. The center moved from its original building in 1980 into the red brick building that occupies the full block on Lenox Avenue between 135th and 136th. Having been there for about 17, 18 years, I've um, had the opportunity to discover um, more about Langston and his meaning, not just for me, but for this community and indeed for the nation and the world. Okay, this is um, the Cosmogram, and this is the spiritual censor of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and it's in honor of both Langston Hughes and Orturdo Schomburg. Orturdo Schomburg uh, is very special and important to us because he's a person who decided uh, he would collect information and documents about black uh, history and black culture at a time when it was not valued. Uh, he came to Harlem in the early 1900s. He befriended uh, Langston Hughes and the two of them together started the Harlem Renaissance. If you look down at the Cosmogram, you'll see uh, seven fragments of his poem which was first published in the Crisis magazine which W.E.B. Du Bois uh, edited uh, and it's called The Negro Speaks for Rivers. This cosmogram is called Rivers. Langston had been cremated at the time of his death. It turned out that his ashes were actually sitting on the desk of the executor of his estate at Brown University. Langston, a son of Harlem, had been sitting up in Providence, Rhode Island, on a desk at Brown University. <laughs> Didn't quite make too much sense to me to have him continue to be in that uh, uh, kind of exile. So we were able to talk with the uh, executive of the state and convince him to have Langston Hughes interred beneath the center of that cosmogram. And if you look right in the center, you have the last line of the poem, which says, my soul has grown deep like the rivers. Underneath that one spot are the ashes or cremains of Langston Hughes. And underneath the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture runs the Harlem River.
Action Hughes began writing poetry in high school and while on a train crossing the Mississippi on his way to visit his father in Mexico when he was 17 years old, he wrote one of his greatest poems, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I, I bathed in the Euphrates, Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. You've got to do a toast to being in Brother Langston's house, sitting in a room where he wrote. This is a toast to Brother Langston and his spirit that just comes. And as a consequence, we wanted to have a celebration, sit down with some poets, some of the younger poets. He made it real for me. Some of the older poets. He was like an ox for the people to ride. What do we have in common with this man named Langston? He loved black people. You're right, he loved black people. His father wanted to be an engineer. He was an engineer. He engineered some bad poetry, didn't he? And I was growing up in Harlem. I always had this sense that he cared about me as a black child. Yeah. And it was comforting. When I first mm. came to, okay. to New York, the first poem I ever published, I got a postcard in green ink. <laughs> she always wrote in green ink. Mm -hmm. and said, Hail Leroy from Harlem. <laughs> I understand you color. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like from out of nowhere. Right. You know? So yeah. you can imagine what a little 20 some year old poet look and say, what? Langston Hughes. Mm. Right. When we started to travel, and read our poetry in the South, the amazing thing was that you go into people's homes and there were two books they had, the Bible and a copy of Langston Hughes' poetry. Mm -hmm. His poetry was, it was, was deep, it was simple. Very difficult to do, to be simple and complex. And complex. Yeah. Especially after you go to college, you want to, you know, use yeah. your vocabulary. I would open the New York Post and there would be Jesse B. Simple. <laughs> and I used to look at my father and say, well, why would he write this? When I came out of the university and I went to the Schomburg and began my apprenticeship and read Simple and understood that, that, that this cultural folk hero, what he was, and the language that Langston was, was, was using, and the humor that was involved with that. And I came off that high horse of education, you know, uh, speaking proper English. I went to a place called Cuba in 1977. I, uh, I did a speech and people kind of re responded nicely to it at this festival. And one of the officials said, Professor Sanchez, what do you want? And coming from New York, I said, i like to meet Nicholas Guillen. Two hours later, they came and gathered me up and took me. And he was in this room, much from, from, this, from this dining room all the way back to the front. He had a big, huge office, and his legs were bad at that time. And I came in, he said, oh, Sonia, Sonia Sanchez, como Langston. And he grabbed me, and, he, and because his legs were weak, his arms were stronger, and he grabbed me so hard I couldn't breathe. And I thought, oh God, I'm in Cuba, and I'm gonna die. <laughs> I stopped struggling and leaned into his breath, and we breathed together. And that's what we want you to do and understand. That's what Langston did, you know what I'm saying? He was there for us to lean into his breath so we could breathe the kind of poetry he wanted us to write. And what we need you to write also at some of the younger poets. Where do we go after we die? Is it to hell to smell the devil's fish fry? Or is it to heaven to catch the Lord in a lie? Where do we go after we die? Is it to the grave where slaves wear platinum chains? Or is it to the ocean where bleached ghosts stake their claims? Where do we go after we die? Is it to the liquor store to spill dust for the others who ain't here? Or is it to the freezer to eat the meat that has disappeared? I was introduced to Langston Hughes back in the 1980s when I was in college at Rutgers University. Um, like a lot of um, black people who grew up in post civil rights America and went through these wonderful integrated schools. I didn't learn anything about black people nor black writers. And so when I got to Rutgers and took a couple black lit courses, uh, it was one course I took on the Harlem Renaissance. 
And Langston was the writer out of all the writers that I read that really struck me, you know, because I felt like he was speaking the language of the people. I dug the fact that he called his first book uh, The Weary Blues because, you know, you're talking about the 80s when I was in school, so hip hop was coming up on the scene. And so, you know, he basically was using the music of the time just the way a lot of rappers were using the music of my time. At a time when people, a lot of people were running from their blackness, he was running to it and his writing was very therapeutic and it made you, it empowered you, it made you feel proud to be black. <laughs> we are the blues ourselves. That's right. Our favorite color, where we've been half here, half gone. We are the blues ourselves, the actual guineas, the original Jews, the first Caucasians. That's why we are the blues ourselves. That's why we are the actual song, so dark and tragic, so old and magic. That's why we are the blues ourselves. Here he is, mm -hmm. in his house, in his living room, saying some of his poetry and saying some of our own poetry and it connects <coughs> up so beautifully. I've been keeping company with the layaway man. Oh. I say I've been keeping company with the layaway man. Each time he come by we do it on the installment plan. Mm. Every Saturday night he come walking up to my door. I say every Saturday night he come walking up to my door. Empty pockets hanging way on down to the floor. Gonna get me a man who pays for it up front. I say Langston I'm gonna get me a man who pays for it up front cause when I needs it can't wait till the middle of next month. I've been keeping company with the layaway man. I say I've been keeping company with the layaway man each time he come by we do it on the installment plan each time he come by we do it on the installment plan shopping for my school books I passed the poetry section or something like that and I saw a uh, an edition of selected poems by Langston Hughes it wasn't on any required reading list and I don't know if I had permission to actually put it on the voucher but uh, I picked it up and I saw all these references to Harlem and, and jazz and Lenox Avenue and the language was, was something that, you know, I could relate to. Mmm, those glazed donuts from Georgie smell like they just came out the oven. <laughs> A breeze of fresh collard greens bum rushes me from the open doors of Soul Food Haven. Damn, I'm hungry. Bob Marley's self-determination blasting out of totally Rasta-owned awareness records. Martin's dream making my hair stand. And Malcolm up the block telling me to hit back if I really want to be free. Public enemy bringing the noise. Little queen and her stroller points to the discount toys. Homemade kick Capri tapes at high black market prices cause they booming. Want to make a donation to the nation brother? A fight, a fight. A Moreno and his hermano again? Did you hear the power? Boom, blah, guns or drums, take your pick. Skunk weed is all I need to forget what I gotta do and why. <laughs> Love staring at me with a sly smile. I go from a hip hop strut to a blues rut. Now let me ask you something. Did you hear all that while you was walking up on her 25th Street? <laughs> <laughs> Did you see all that while you was walking up on 25th Street? Did you feel all that while you was walking up on 25th Street? Or was you just on your way to pay the phone bill? Uh. <laughs> the night is beautiful, so are the faces of my people. The stars are beautiful, also are the eyes of my people. The sun is beautiful, also is the soul of my people. Everybody searching for love, giving up no rhythm. No, 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 no. Everybody searching for love, giving up no vibration. Hey, 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 hey. everybody searching for love.
same way the artists today struggle. You know, Langston had issues with credibility amongst his peers because he often received, you know, assistance from the greater, broader um, white community to come in and they were wondering whether or not he was, they were influencing his work. You can feel it when it happens, a sort of depression in the hidden places when conjured up thoughts become larger than mountainside echoes. Struggle is, a, a, is an essential part of our art. Um, and so therefore, uh, I feel he may be able to recognize in this younger generation and I think pridefully uh, be able to uh, acknowledge that we have come a long way. Fooling children with machine guns, those same weeping angels who let poems, poems by Langston, those same weeping angels who let poems, poems by Mary, those same weeping angels who let poems long forgotten be rewritten, retitled, rewritten, retitled, re-understood. With some of us, I think he'll he would still be proud and say that there's still an urgency. We gotta say this, and, and there's still a, a need for us to tell our stories in a way because we're still fighting against the system that really wants to suppress our voices. Little brown lady with brown eyes. 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 Deep brown eyes and 12 hands. Carrying her groceries, children, dreams, language, her memories, bullet wounds, stress, OT, future, pocketbook, and temper. Sometimes we, we talk about him, we do speak about him in this superhero fashion, you know, when he was a regular cat in Harlem, hustling and selling his books out of his, the trunk of his car. How dangerous their footsteps seem so close to home. People always tell me you should slow down. I said, well, I think you should think faster. You know, we have a lot going on on the planet, and I'm just trying to keep up with the rhythm of the universe. In 1926, he was speaking of how Negro artists, no matter what people say, are still going to perform. They're still going to write. So I write, remembering Harlem, remembering him, remembering my mother and her mother and her mother and their grandmothers and forefathers and foremothers before them. I stand on the shoulders of Langston Hughes. I'm from Harlem. I'm from fist fights, nosebleeds, hot concrete in 125th Street. I'm from Harlem. I'm from Edgecombe, drivers up the hill and Sugar Hill. I'm from Harlem. Wow. Harlem is a place where when you arrive here, you know that you've arrived somewhere. It's got a kind of a rhythm to it that's like no place else. I went to a private school and they gave us about, well, what they said was about a month of Black History Month. And we actually got about a good solid week of Black History. And one thing I can remember is that Langston Hughes was someone who was mentioned continually in the years of me growing up in school. It stuck with me because he was from where I was from, you know, no more than eight blocks away from where I grew up. Um, because he was a writer, and that was a privilege. And because he spoke to, he spoke to us and he spoke for us. What should be gleaned is that you can take what you feel and apply it positively. Writing is a beautiful outlet. We want you to put your hands together right now for Brother Earl talking about the ghetto. The ghetto. Where dreams get deferred, but prison sentences never are. Everybody's a superstar, known from near and far. Pushing an exotic car, parked in the projects at his mom's house. And his spouse has two kids that ain't his, one on the way that might be. And his child by a chick he don't have much to say to. And his other child by yet another chick he don't have much to say to. While they're raised by many men, always in a different way, too. The most confusing 24 hours in the hood, Father's Day. Sad, but true, the ghetto, where drug dealers on the auction block, I mean corner block, selling rock, but really waiting to be sold. And me, my conceptualism of the ghetto is hell. We are born in bondage and breastfed sin, but it's never too late to be what you could have been. And though we run in a race, we were never meant to win. The means to our end is examining how we begin.
He was one of the poets that paved the way for myself and other poets that's out here today. Oh Harlem, oh Harlem, what have I to lose? From corruption to destruction, what have I to choose? Liquor stores on every corner, human beings wrapped in blues. And every day I hear them calling your name on the news. Oh Harlem, oh Harlem, it is me you have misled. My children raped and sodomized, another shot in the head. It seems Harlem is peaceful, I heard it once said. It seems our reason for living prefers to be dead. This year, the Postal Service's honoree for the Black Heritage Commemorative Stamp Series is Harlem's, America's, the world's, Langston Hughes. People like Langston Hughes who speak out against injustice, they are the people who make us what we said we would be, what we want to be, what we should be, what we someday hold on to the hope will be. February 1st, 2002 was Langston Hughes' centennial birthday. I worked in Harlem, he worked in Harlem. I live in Harlem, he lived in Harlem. I love Harlem, he loved Harlem. He was extremely talented, I live in Harlem. <laughs> he was honored throughout the world, and of course at home in Harlem at the Schomburg, and by his beloved fraternity, Omega Sci-Fi. Why? why were we treated so bad? Uh, Brother Langston Hughes came to Zai Phi after he left Lincoln University. Uh, he was initiated to the fraternity at Lincoln University in 1927. He was, uh, as our archives tell us, a prominent member of the fraternity, very active. Him being an Omega man is very special because all the things that he did in his professional life and in his personal life really reflects what we do as Omegas. I'm going to talk to you about the Lincoln from the three for one joint uptown. Many of you sitting in the room, I'm sure, have had a little rum and coke with Langston you one time or another. <laughs> Langston had a, a hollow state of mind. He took the time to look into what is the heart of Harlem. Langston paid homage to his community through his works. He epitomizes our greatest expectations uh, for our people, not just in terms of the Harlem experience, but in terms of the African diaspora. When Mr. Hughes passed in 1967, and it was an unexpected situation. Though Mr. Hughes had prepared for his demise and had made very clear how he wanted his funeral to be conducted, not held, it was going to be conducted. His funeral would point out what he was like. Langston choreographed his own funeral. He put it on tape. I, I want people to come away with my, the spirit of, of the writing that I did, which is based on the music that I love from, of, of the, from the African-American musical traditions. The first thing was you, when you came into the funeral home, you, you viewed the body immediately, and then you went into separate rooms because he said he didn't want you to spend the whole time staring at his corpse. I remember Randy Weston played. Uh, um, I remember Lena Horne was there. Then, <laughs> at the end of the funeral, he had this statement. He said, I want to leave you with one thought. And then he played, do nothing till you hear from me. They did play, do nothing till you hear from me. That was his thing, you know. So you couldn't, you know, you had to laugh throughout the whole funeral. That's the way Langston Hughes was. He was a hero. The Harlem Renaissance, the 30s, the 40s, the McCarthyism of the 50s, and into the Black Power Movement of the 60s. I mean, he transversed all those. And he wrote about the best that America could be. So he isn't somebody that you can put in a book and put aside to pick up once a year. He's that kind of poet that can stay with you every day. He leaves behind uh, reminders of what the people can do, should do, and will do if we give them a chance. 
Langston Hughes, music, jazz, improvisation, how to take the impossible and make it dance. That's Langston, an ambassador of laughter and love and music for all the world. We're glad to share him with you, but he really belongs to us. Bring me all your dreams, you dreamers. Bring me all your heart melodies. And I may wrap them in a blue cloud cloth away from the two rough fingers of the world. I'm your dream keeper. Your Dream Keeper Your Dream Keeper All you dreamers of the world yeah, yeah, yeah. Now dreams are not available To the dreamers Not so To the singers And some Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fetch like a sword and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crushing sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Send for the Pie Piper and let him pipe the rats away. Send for Robin Hood to clinch the anti-poverty program. Send for the Fairy Queen with a wave of the wand to make us all into princes and princesses. Send for King Arthur to bring the Holy Grail. Send for Old Man Moses to lay down the law. Send for Jesus to preach the Sermon on the Mount. Send for Dreyfus to cry, Jacuz! Send for Dead Blind Lemon to sing B flat blues. For Cinque saying, run a new flag up the mast. For old John Brown who knew slavery couldn't last. Send for Lenin, don't you dare. He can't come here. Send for Trotsky, what? Don't confuse the issue, please. Send for Uncle Tom on his mighty knees. Send for Lincoln, send for Grant. Send for Frederick Douglass, Garrison, Beecher, Lowell. Send for Harriet Tubman. Old Sojourner Truth. Send for Marcus Garvey. What? Sufi. Who? Father Divine. Where? Du Bois. When? Malcolm. Oh. Send for Stokely. No? Then send for Adam Powell on a non-subpoena day. 
Send for the Pie Piper to pipe our rats away. And if nobody comes, send for me. <laughs>